Good morning, welcome to In Conversation. It's uh, another episode uh, and uh, I just want to start by saying you might be watching this when it's premiering in the morning or you might even be watching it in the afternoon. Um, we're recording it on Wednesday evening. So um, first of all, an apology for my dishevelled look. Um, my hair is just getting <laughs> to the point where it's completely out of control and I managed to get out in the garden today. So this is kind of my gardening wear. And uh, also, because it's the evening, we're actually having a glass of wine. So we're not drinking alcohol at 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, so that's just kind of a disclaimer, really, before before someone were. reports <laughs> us to the Archdeacon that the, the clergy living in Bramall Vicarage are, are alcoholics. We're not, um, but I just thought it would be helpful to do that. And we moved rooms because we thought we fancied a comfortable, comfortable chair. Uh, we are nearly at the end of our journey of Lent. We are nearly at Easter, so um, it is time to go out and start buying Easter eggs. Um, and I know that it's, uh, it's that time because um, at St Michael's we've been reading through a book entitled Living His Stories, some of our Lent groups, um, which is a book that's been written uh, on behalf of the Archbishop of Canterbury for Lent this year. Uh, and it's a book that has been, I felt, really helpful. Um, Jess hasn't read it all. She's read extracts and things like that. But it's a book that's exploring the theme of evangelism. Uh, the subtitle is Revealing the Extraordinary Love of God in Very Ordinary Ways. Evangelism is one of the essential activities of the church, but I think certainly maybe over the last five or six decades, the last half century, it certainly had a bad name and, and may not have actually been talked about in terms of evangelism, certainly in the UK before that. Um, when you use the word evangelism, what does that conjure within you? What does that make you think of? Um, what emotions does it bring up? I think at its simplest, it's about telling people about Jesus. Um, and I think that can be done in numerous different ways. I think in terms of the feelings that it conjures up, instinctively it conjures up fear. <laughs> um, and that's probably to do with, I think for a lot of people, their vision of evangelism can be quite narrow. Um, and, and what they often picture in their head is either the kind of bloke with the billboard on the corner of the street or the person knocking on their door to hand them a leaflet. Um, and so that kind of stuff terrifies me and just kind of that going up to strangers terrifies me. Um, but on the kind of flip side of that, if I was to broaden my view of evangelism, it's not as scary as it first seems. Okay, um, and, and that's something that, that the author Hannah Steele talks about in this book, really. She says, um, actually, the, the street preaching and the going and knocking on people's doors and ramming down people's throats uh, the message of salvation and actually maybe even just calling them a sinner to start off with isn't particularly helpful. And she even suggests, actually, that's probably not the way Jesus did it. Um, and I think maybe occasionally he did do that because people have wound him up and he had a bad day or he's feeling grumpy. But if you look at the way in which Jesus did evangelism, in the way in which Jesus invited people um, to, to follow him and to, to know God, it was through relationship. Um, and, and he spent time building relationships with people, not robots or whatever, but building relationships with people of a real diversity. He didn't just go to the blokes he hung out with at the, the local pub or carpentry shop or whatever. Um, <laughs> and yes, okay, he did gather a group of 12 men around him. Um, but he went and met with sick people, blind people, prostitutes, adulterers, um, even the religious ruling classes, um, Romans, tax women. collectors. I mean, I, I've taken women for granted, I guess, but, but women. Um, and he built relationships with all these people. And in a relationship, we read so many stories of people's lives being changed. What is it about a relationship that's so important? I think ultimately it's about that kind of, that being allowed to be who you are with, the, with another person being allowed to be who they are. So I think the thing I was thinking about as you were talking there 
was actually evangelism could be us sharing our lives with people yeah um and that doesn't mean you know ramming down people's throats the fact that we're christians it just means us being who we are that happen to be christians um but doing the things we enjoy you know going to the places that we like to go to away from church almost um and being people of of faith in those places not in a kind of upfront in your face kind of way but in a very natural unassuming way almost yeah definitely um something that, that hannah Steele says here is that actually part of building a relationship with mon is is about building trust mm. and building trust to a place where you can be vulnerable because actually to tell someone what you believe in or to tell someone that you trust a be trust in a being for your whole life that you can't see it's actually quite a scary thing to do mm. um, and so she kind of suggests actually the reason you build relationships with someone is not because you want to tell them about Jesus yeah. but because as humans we are created to be relational that's why so many people have found um, lockdown difficult and I, I think I'm prepared even to say introverts have found lockdown <laughs> difficult because whilst introverts like just spending time with themselves mm -hmm. predominantly actually they have still been robbed from relationships with others which actually naturally i said it before is um a human indwelt thing we are created to be in relationship with others so we build relationships because it's something we need it's something they need and we we find people that um are easy to relate to but in growing a relationship and coming to like someone not necessarily a love relationship but a like relationship uh, we value that person so much we want them to know about the love of god mm. because the love of god has changed our life so much and if they mean something to us we want them to experience what we have experienced in that experience of love yeah definitely i think like anything though there is always a balance to be struck in that i think definitely. um certainly uh, in the circles that we've kind of been in in the last 10 years gosh dare i say that um that kind really of young those kind of young evangelical circles that are often find found in universities um i say that because that's our experience of the last 10 years but um there can sometimes be a danger that you kind of flirt to convert to use that horrible phrase or you know you um yeah. what's that you you have friends who aren't christians with the, with the intention of making them christians yeah. at the end of it and actually when i think about my time at university certainly and and the relationships that have actually stuck with me post all of that the people that i am still close that i am closest to most all bar one i would say are my non-christian friends um and they are the people who i tend to go to um with any kind of major decision or if anything kind of significant happens in my life because often they're much more relatable than, than yeah. the christian people <laughs> um it sounds terrible to say doesn't it but actually sometimes i don't want to hear the kind of christian cliche stuff i don't want to be um told that you know everything happens for a reason and things like that i just i want people to kind of sit with me in the kind of mess mm -hmm. and chaos of life from a very human point of view and that's not to say that God can't be in that, but actually sometimes I think it's just important for us to strike that balance and not, not to see people as projects. That was the word I was looking for before. Um, but, but to kind of slowly over time, as you say, to just be as we are with people and hopefully out of that will come what's important to us. Definitely. Um, I was the reason why I was flicking through the book was not because I wasn't interested in what she was saying. I was <laughs> listening. I can multitask. I'm one of those rare men. That yeah, can. he does prove you wrong when you think he's not listening. Um, but I was looking for a particular quote in in the book and I couldn't find it. And um, but it relates to what you're saying. Actually, sharing life with people and doing life with people and through doing life with people, they will see Jesus in your life mm. and hopefully will be inquisitive. Um, and the quote I was looking for um, is, is Hannah Steele actually likens the story of evangel uh, evangelism to a story. Um, Jesus doesn't say, uh, he does at one point, but when he calls his disciples, he doesn't say, repent and believe, you are doomed sinners, you're going to go to hell, you must turn and be saved and be baptised and all that. He says, come and follow me. He invites 
who the people who become disciples into his story uh, and for those who have been baptized for those who have chosen to follow jesus they have been invited into his story yeah. um, and that is essentially what evangelism is about it's it's telling a story and the story is actually really simple um, god loved the world he made the world he cares about the world so much he came and lived in the world mm. he experienced everything we experienced and then he died that we might be able to put this world right again and yeah okay we're not doing a brilliant job at it <laughs> but actually we've made some fairly good steps forward i think mm. a few weeks ago we talked about the miracle of, of science for example um, and so actually the task of evangelism is about telling the story of God in our lives yeah. and it's about inviting people into that story that they may then be invited by God himself into his story which yeah. is what I love and I think but actually there's something in that that so we've just sat here for 10 minutes or so talking about actually telling the story without necessarily using words um, and there's that phrase that everybody bans about supposedly from St. Francis that you preach the gospel and when necessary use words. But actually, I think there's something wrong. important ab about him. words. And, and the Bible says, doesn't it, actually, that we, we need to have an answer when people ask us, you know, why we believe, mm. why we have this hope uh, in Jesus. And I think um, I've seen people kind of get it wrong disastrously so many times to a point where it kind of almost makes you cringe and not want to say that you belong to the same group um, as that person I, i'm particularly thinking of a friend of mine who who isn't a christian um but found herself <laughs> in lots of christian circles and somebody just said to her well what have you got to lose um well she gave him a good answer actually and there was a lot for her to lose in her opinion but that just felt a bit of a cop out of an answer to me and I think we've got to stress yes it is about living our lives but equally there's something about the words that we use within that um, to tell Jesus's story and actually we've kind of got to have that that concrete in our minds we've got to know what it is and why it is particularly um, so that when people do ask us, um, which we hope they will, out of those relationships that we form and the trust that we build, that, that actually what we what we say is as attractive as what we do. So are you posing the question to those people that, that watch this? Um, are you asking them what difference does Jesus make in their lives? Yeah, I think so. I think one of the questions that I love asking people, partly because I know it makes them squirm, but also because I know it makes them think is if you were put on trial for being a Christian, what evidence would there be to convict you? And if your only answer is I go to church on a Sunday, is that good enough evidence? I would probably say no. Okay. Why not? Because I, I personally think that um, gathered worships coming together on a Sunday however it looks is is only a part of a much bigger picture and actually what we do on a Sunday should inform and strengthen what we do Monday through to Saturday and is that because the Christian faith is not about doing but it's about relationship definitely yeah and I think sometimes we can get so caught up on the doing and we can almost kind of punish ourselves when when we don't feel like we're doing enough um and yet i i remember um a, a friend a priest colleague of mine saying wanting to want to do something is enough so so for prayer for example wanting to be able to be better at prayer is sometimes enough than kind of crucifying yourself almost to be to be the best prayer there is definitely um, and I think that's if, if evangelism is a scary idea to you as Jess said it was to her um, or even a dirty word I think um, we're all called to evangelize mm -hmm. in that we're all called to tell God's story within our life that is essentially all evangelism is telling other people about what God has been doing in our life not necessarily 
out on the street or in the middle of Brahman or just at a random point in time. But when someone asks us, and I suppose that has two implications. The first of which is, do we know what God is doing in our life? Mm. And have we got a story to tell? And if we haven't got a story to tell, then actually some attention might be needed within our relationship with God. And the second implication is, is God noticeable enough in your life that someone might actually ask you about him? Yeah. It's easy for us because we wear dog collars. We were at picking Samuel up from nursery the other day. And uh, are they teachers or supervisors or... I think what are confusingly they? for this season they're actually called key workers <laughs> okay so the the people that look after samuel when he's at nursery um they actually stopped us and asked us a few questions about baptism in particular because they they knew we wear we wear dog collars um and so it's slightly harder for those people that, that don't wear collars yeah. dog collars but um jess preached on sunday at st michael's on mothering sunday and she talked about actually um needing to become sorry that's my phone going off it should be on silent um she talked about actually we needing to be taking on the likeness of god because we're part of his family mm. um if you weren't there you can go back on youtube and see it um and and she's preaching somewhere in the middle of that recording um but actually if people can't spot god in our life then actually maybe we're not following particularly well yeah there were, there were two thoughts going through my head as you were speaking one of which I can remember and the other I can't. So I'll share the one I can remember <laughs> in the hope that the other one might magically um, appear in my head. Um, and and the, I share this and it kind of, in some respects, seems somewhat unrelated and contradictory to what you've said, but it, it's not meant to be. But something that somebody said to me once that I've kind of found comfort in is we're all called to evangelise but we're not all called to be evangelists. Definitely. And I think it's Completely about agree separating that. the two out so that actually if the thought of doing evangelism is a scary thing for you, like don't worry about that. Don't kind of stress yourself out about it because actually what we see um, in Paul's letters particularly is the fact that God gives each of us different gifts. Um, we're not all meant to have all of them at any one time we're all called to something specific and what we bring enhances what other people bring when we come together so yes we are all called to um, share our story and and in that you know hopefully share the story of Jesus but we're not necessarily all called to be evangelists we're not all necessarily called to be people that do that all the time so so I guess to, to, to put people into perspective um Stephen Cottrell, who's the new Archbishop of York, he would say he is an evangelist and he recognises that he's got a calling as an evangelist because he's particularly good at communicating the Christian faith. Um, and I would tend to agree with him. He's just written a new book and it's uh, published this week called uh, A Letter to England. Mm. I think it is. I need to, to pre-order it or even just order it <laughs> and get it delivered so I can uh, put it on my pile of books that's just over there uh, and read it. Um, but it, he says the book was written following a question being asked by to him by a barista in a coffee shop. Yeah. Um, and he's written the, the, the book as a letter to say, this is what I believe and why I believe it. And that comes naturally to him. Whereas for a lot of people, actually, that, that task of actually telling people about God doesn't come naturally. Um, and, and so there are some people that where it comes naturally, you'd call them an evangelist. But that doesn't get the rest of us off the hook. Mm. We're all called to witness to Jesus, even if it's just by actually saying when, when our mates go to the local casino, so they actually know I'm not going because actually I don't believe in gambling. It's happened. Carry on. You've remembered. I'm done. <laughs> um, oh, here we go. I've forgotten now. No, um, what I was going to say is, is linked to that, actually. So that must have been divine inspiration in and of itself, really. But... Um, sometimes that whole kind of you ask you pose the question about do we actually have a story to tell and, and pr precluded that with do we see god in our lives um, and something i found really helpful um over the years um was an exercise that we had to do um as part of the discernment process for ordination um which was to write a timeline of your life um and and to kind of almost pick out those places where you could see god um 
And often for me personally, I don't know about you, but I don't necessarily always see God in the moment. And yet hindsight is a wonderful thing, isn't it? And as I look back over the last uh, 28, nearly 29 years of my life, there are different parts of my story where I, where I definitely um, see God in that, you know, right back to the very beginning in the days that I don't, I'm not old enough to remember. Um, you know, for me, for example, um, I nearly died twice uh, before I was 18 months old. Um, and I see God in that. Absolutely. And yet, obviously, at 18 months old, I couldn't have seen God in that, or at least I'm not aware of myself seeing God in that. So I just offer that to you really as, as an exercise that you might want to do um, to write out a timeline of your life. And I appreciate that for some of you, um, that might be, you might need a rather large piece of paper and that might go on a lot longer than mine. So um, one of my Bibles is just the other side of the sofa. I just picked it up. And uh, right in the front cover of, the, of this Bible, actually, I have written down um, my story. Uh, and it's just in note form, but it's two sides of A5 paper. Um, and interestingly, the last date on it is September 2012. Um, so uh, even, even our wedding isn't on here yet. So maybe I need an exercise in filling the next page out um, from, from 2012 onwards. But um, actually, I filled two pages out just up to 2012, which is when I was uh, 21. Uh, I'm now 29. Uh, so I've got another eight years to fill out. Uh, so that's maybe just one page, although a lot's happened. Um, but it sits in the front of my Bible. And when I go away, um, when I go on conferences, when I, I go on, on holidays and things, actually, this is the Bible I take with me. Um, and I guess there's something symbolic in the fact that it sits in here, mm. um, along with all sorts of other things, including photographs and, and so on. Yeah, and I think something that we um, see in the Psalms particularly, when things aren't perhaps going all that great, um, we, we hear time and time again, actually, the Psalmists reminding themselves of God's faithfulness um, to them, to the generations previous to them. Um, and and I, I kind of just commend it to you really as an exercise for yourself that sometimes we just need reminding of where God has been throughout our life. So that if we're at a particular point where we can't really see him, um, we can at least trust that he has been there before. So he will he will be there for us again. Great. Thanks, Jess. So um, that is a conversation. And I can't see how long we've been talking for. but um, 22 minutes. 22 minutes. So it's probably <laughs> worth wrapping up. Um, we hope that was helpful. Um, I, I felt that's probably more helpful than some of the past few weeks. Um, so, uh, yeah, we're done. Um, next week, uh, as we prepare for Palm Sunday, um, we're actually going to be doing a little bit of thinking about uh, culture and uh, particularly kind of celebrity culture. Mm. And what we've seen over the last uh, few months, few years, is a number of uh, major Christian names fall off their pedestals uh, as we've learned more about their life. And uh, we just want to reflect on that and reflect on maybe some of the practices that we have had as Christians have contributed to that uh, and ways that actually we can maybe contribute to the conversation on, on celebrity culture and why it's done so much damage to so many people. Mm. So, so that's next week's conversation. Uh, until then, whatever you're doing, stay safe, take care. And see you soon.